Now, neonatology. Babies are neonates for the first 28 days of their life. It's not the first month, it's the first 28 days. So here's the thing. Newborns refer to a baby that has just been born all the way up to a few hours old. Then they become neonates. Then they become infants. And then at one year old, they become toddlers. Toddlers are one to three. Then they become children, pediatrics, however you want to differentiate them. Where do we put the distinction between ch pediatric and adult? That depends on your local protocols. We generally will go by either about 15 years of age or the onset of puberty. But realistically, you look at a patient, you know, and most medications, which are the true differentiation of is this an adult or a pediatric patient, has to do with their weight. And once you get over about 67 pounds, you're pretty much an adult. All right. Now, obviously not legally. Legally, you're or a pediatric until you're 18, unless you've been emancipated. So when we say neonatal resuscitation, that's actually a bit of a misnomer because it should be newborn resuscitation. But hey, I'm not here to complain about that. I mean, I am and I'm going to, but that's all I'm going to say. So here's what I want you guys to know about neonatal resuscitation. We expect baby's heart rate to be very high. Like, I, like you learned earlier, 120 to 160 is not is, is the average, okay? Usually on the higher end of that spectrum. So let's say baby comes out and baby's heart rate is under 100. How do we wanna treat that? We want to try to stimulate the baby via positive pressure ventilation. Be careful with supplemental oxygen because baby might become hypothermic with all that cool air rushing over them. So we do need to stimulate their lungs to breathe faster. This should stimulate their heart to beat faster. We're going to give them positive pressure ventilations for about 30 seconds, and then we're gonna reassess. If their heart rate is still under 100, we might need to perform some compressions to get it up over 100, and then we can stop compressing. Now, if we deliver baby and baby's heart rate is under 60, we need to start compressions immediately. 60, a rate, heart rate of, of 50s in the newborn is not enough to perfuse. We do need to perform CPR. So again, under 60, you go right to CPR. If we're in the 60 to 100 range, you do 30 seconds of BVMing, positive pressure ventilation, and then you reassess. If it's still under 100, compressions, and then reassess. And once we get over 100, we can stop. If it's over 100, good, we're golden. All right, one of these, all right, no, nope, there we go. Child mortality, it's considered for infant and children under the age of five. Now, worldwide child mortality rates have gone down significantly, but they are still a problem in underdeveloped countries. Again, neonates are the first 28 days of their life. Newborns, recently born, usually considered the first few hours. 6% of deliveries will require life support. I think you guys are gonna see this in one of the quizzes. The rate of complications increase as birth weight decreases. So the smaller the baby is, the more likely we're gonna have complications. Again, these are two very big takeaways here. <clears throat> if mom is outside of the, the sweet spot for delivering babies, also remember that's at 16 or 20 to 35, much more likely to have compromise as well, as well as anything else going on, drugs, medication, um, post-term gestation, Toxemia, diabetes, premature labor, all of these things. Recall that the instant the neonate is delivered, they transition to breathing air. We talked about this, how they are very sensitive to the hypoxia of their cells, so they need oxygenation. They're going to be breathing very fast. It's going to take them a little bit to pink up, though. All right, dry the babies. How do we stimulate the baby? Dry them on. Drying them off usually does the trick. You can flick the soles of their feet or kind of rub their back and their stomach. Things like that will kind of stimulate them. Babies can take a lot more quote unquote abuse than you would, you would think. You don't need to be necessarily super gentle with the baby. Obviously you need to be more gentle than you would, but babies can take a little bit of quote unquote roughing up in order to stimulate them. We also put those little hats on their heads, the little beanies. This is because they lose an incredible amount of heat through their heads. The reason newborns, uh, neonates sleep so much, like 16 hours a day, is because their brain is very, very busy. 
okay? As an adult, our brain is taking up about, a, about 20% of our, all of our energy. And by the way, that number is exactly the same, whether we are just sitting there mindlessly watching cat videos on YouTube, or if we're like doing very complex, hard thinking, that does not change the amount of calories your brain burns. You don't burn any extra calories from thinking hard. All right. Now, babies, their brain is using about 65% of all of their energy. So that's why they sleep so much. All right. Now, all of the major problems that we're going to see with neonate births and childbirths are going to be related to their airway. Remember that a kid's airway is less comparable or is less useful than an adult's because their tongue is bigger, comparatively wise, bigger blocker of the airway. So anything like Pierre Robin syndrome or cleft palate or chonal atresia or any of these things are going to cause potential airway concerns. You guys can see this is almost like a very severe overbite. It has to do with problem. A chonal atresia is when the bone does not separate in the nasal passageways. Baby can't breathe through here. We'll usually discover this pretty early on and this needs to be surgically corrected. By the way, that's going to be the majority of these answers. It needs to be surgically corrected. Macroglossia, their tongue is too big. Again, airway concerns. We're doing APGAR at one in five minutes. All right. If the baby has not breathed within the first 15 seconds, we might need to do some positive pressure ventilation as well in case it doesn't start spontaneously breathing. Okay. Um, might even need to intubate the babies as well. Have your suction equipment out and ready to go. Have your tubes ready to go if you're able to do those things. Okay, moving on through these. A couple other problems that baby can face. This one is called, what is this one called? This is a uh, tracheoesophageal fistula. So this is when the esophagus and the trachea, which normally form next to each other, can form inside. So food will start going into the esophagus and either it can enter into the trachea or it more likely just gets blocked off and the baby can't feed. So the baby will take in a little bit of milk and then start throwing up immediately. This also needs to be surgically corrected. We used to be able to access, if we needed IV access on a baby, we used to be able to use the umbilical cords. Literally just um, put your IV right in the umbilical vein. We call this umbilical vein cannulation. It's not recommended anymore, but they are still doing it in the hospitals in extreme cases. But you know what else works? IOs. IOs work just fine. All right. Here's something interesting. Whoops, excuse me. Bradycardia. We know that to treat bradycardia in an adult patient, we use atropine. It's an anticholinergic drug and it increases the heart rate naturally by having influences on the atrial, or sorry, the sinoatrial node. However, little kids do not have the same vagus nerve um, formation that adults do. It's going to develop as we grow up and it won't really take place until the kid's at least 10. This means that we do not treat bradycardia with atropine in pediatrics. We treat it with epinephrine. It's kind of an interesting change there. Meconium, we were talking a little bit about this earlier. It's cellular debris and waste products taken in by the fetus in utero. Usually happens when the kid gets distressed. And then the kid could aspirate it or breathe it into his, his lungs. Aspiration has a pretty high mortality rate, unfortunately. <clears throat> a lot of these same babies are going to be um, the ones that are in, in risk, especially post-term fetal distress. Those patients or those babies are going to be at the higher risk for this. All right. Transport to a facility that handles these high risk newborns. Explain what's being done for the, for the kid. All right. Talked about a lot of these things, how we need to treat the baby. The big thing we're looking for is that they're breathing all right and that their circulation is okay. Everything we can do to support that we will do including suctioning, including potentially intubation if needed. 
Here in San Diego, I'm actually not able to intubate pediatrics. It's a, it's a very interesting uh, thing they added to their protocols a, in a couple of years ago. They just took away all of our tubes under the size, I think like a five, and they say no pediatric intubations. Ooh, seems like an overstep to me, but I wasn't there to make that decision. All right, I'm gonna skip over these guys. Again, we consider a bradycardic infant to be a heart rate less than 100. If it's less than 100 BVM, heart rate less than 60 CPR. Heart rate between 60 and 80, but not responding to the BVM, begin chest compressions. If we're coming up with the BVM, we can continue the BVM until they get to 100. At 100, we can discontinue the chest compressions. We might continue with the BVM until they get up to a better respiratory rate or they pink up. If they are hypoglycemic, keep in mind that little kids don't need as much sugar right? But their brain still needs it. We consider an adult patient to be hypoglycemic when they're under 60 milligrams per deciliter. But in kids, we go all the way down to 45. If we're treating that, we're going to probably want to use not D50 that we use in adults, but probably a very um, diluted dose, usually D10, or maybe even D5, which we would take by getting, taking D50 and inserting it into an IV bag in order to get a less of a concentration. All right. All right, all right, all right. Seizures, not so common in newborns, more common in infants and toddlers, which we'll talk about in a little second there. They're, they might have subtle seizures. They might have kind of this weird swimming motion with their arms, pedaling in the legs, apnea. That's the major problem with seizures in adults. So again, that's gonna be the major problem uh, with seizures in kids, especially since they're already not breathing very well, right? Or they're already a little bit respiratory compromised. And then there's the full on tonic clonic seizures. All right. What can cause them to have a seizure? Low blood sugar, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. So their brain not getting enough oxygen or bleeding within their brain. Again, what's a seizure? It's a neuronal discharge of electricity. So if a kid's having this, it's probably going to be either sugar related or a problem with their neuronal tissue. Also metabolic disturbances, meningitis or anencephaly or encephalopathy, sorry, drug withdrawal birth effects. How do we treat them? Oxygenation, D10 for hypoglycemic patients, maybe benzos to stop seizing activity. But keep in mind, we're going to need to provide respiratory um, assistance afterwards. Mental status changes, blah, blah, blah. All right. Okay. I'm going to skip through some of these ones because we don't need to cover this stuff. Any type of bilious vomiting. So if there's a lot of bile in the vomit, expect, expect that there's some sort of esophageal fistula, that thing we were looking at earlier, or there's a problem with their stomach, herniation through the diaphragm, like a hiatal hernia or something else going on there that might be causing them to upchuck their food without getting it in. And obviously this is gonna be a problem because babies have high caloric demands. We might need to start an IV and administer fluid that way. And then we might need to um, get, well, obviously we need to get them to a PICU, pediatric ICU or a NICU, and a neonatal ICU. Diarrhea used to kill a lot more people than it does now. Good medical care in the U.S. has limited the number of infant deaths to around 50. Unfortunately, in developing countries, diarrhea is still the leading cause of infant mortality. Caused by a lot of the same things that cause it in adults. Loose, watery stools. All right. Kind of cover this last one, birth injuries, and then we'll go to lunch. All right, I'm gonna skip through these guys, skip through these guys. We've talked about those ones. Birth defects, we're gonna go over these ones. This won't take too long. All right, diaphragmatic hernia. This is when things are herniating through the diaphragm. Usually the stomach, right? That's really the only thing that's right up against the diaphragm. This is sometimes called a hiatal hernia as well, but can appear in a couple different ways. Now look what this is causing. It's causing the heart to be displaced. It's causing the lungs to be displaced and malformed. Baby's gonna have respiratory compromise. Baby's gonna have circulatory compromise. 
as well as the inability to feed. It's going to need surgery. Airway and ventilation is going to be based on their level of distress. We already went over that. Chonal atresia, remember that's the bone formation, can be bilateral or unilateral. This will later develop into a uh, deviated septum later on in life. This needs to be surgically corrected. Infant's going to be unable to breathe because newborns are obligate nose breathers. They have a lot of trouble breathing through their mouths. Pierre Robin syndrome is a congenital condition of genetic craniofacial effects, which include a cleft palate, as well as other problems, right? Retro, retrognath, retrognathia is um, that underbite. And glossop, glossoptosis is backwards displacement of the tongue. They're going to have difficulty breathing and feeding. And they're also going to be smaller. Now, this is that cleft palate, right? The roof of their mouth can be U-shaped or V-shaped, depending on how severe it is. And then there's the, um, the uh, overbite thing we were looking at there, the displacement of the jaw. Now, cleft lips and palates are also um, a form of this. However, they're, they're different. They're a form of Pierre Robin syndrome. <clears throat> so the condition was previously called hair lip because it resembled the split lip from rabbits but the term was changed because it was considered offensive, offensive to rabbits, I guess. Smoking, diabetes, only maternal age, some seizure medications are more likely to cause this. <clears throat> um, the uh, OBGYN my, my girlfriend um, babysits for sometimes, she, heard, she has a son who has a cleft palate and um, the suspicion as to why that happens because she was 34 when she gave birth to him. So again, sometimes that older birth age can cause that. Now it can be corrected by surgery and it works very well. However, I can say this from experience of meeting this kid, they will have some um, disabilities with, uh, their, with speech impediments early on in life. They might need speech therapists in order to get over those things. Again, the cleft palates can come in various uh, presentations depending on how much of the palate is cleft. Next is tetralogy of fellow. Remember that there's differences in fetal circulation from adult circulation. Well, this means that there's a lot of things that can go wrong when we're born. This has caused a lot of blue baby syndrome. So the baby, things weren't gonna close up correctly. So baby's gonna be blue. He's gonna be very lethargic. He has a heart defect and it's going to cause problems with his circulation. Four anatomical abnormalities. We're not gonna go over the four of them. There they are, but it doesn't matter what the four of them are. All four of them are going to cause the baby to be circulatory compromised or have a compromise of their circulatory system, I should say. It's generally treated with beta blockers, also MS and vasopressors for acute episodes. One of the things it's going to cause is this clubbing in the fingers. As you can see, these are not baby's hands, right? These are clearly adults, but these babies or these guys had tetralogy of flow when they were kids and they had circulatory issues. All right, moving on from that. Hydroplastic left heart syndrome, a severe heart defect that describes an underdeveloped left ventricle. We know that that's not good. Unable to provide enough perfusion to sustain life. It cannot overcome afterload. Treatment, if, if the infant survives, is a series of procedures to restore as much perfusion as possible. However, the ultimate way to treat this is a heart transplant, unfortunately. All right, moving through this one. Any sort of small intestine atresia or stenosis, this is going to cause fluid to back up and then the kid's just gonna start throwing up. Again, surgical fixes. Esophageal atresia stenosis with or without a fistula. This is the thing we were looking at earlier. The trachea comes down and then the esophagus comes down and forms into that. Omphalocele. This is a birth defect where the liver, intestines, and other abdominal organs remain outside the body in a sac due to an abnormality in the development of the muscles. High mortality rate and associated with severe malformations, usually cardiac abnormalities. Another 15, and then 15 percent of babies will be born with something called ophthalm, om, sorry, omphalocele. This is where, um, sorry, hold on. That is on fallacy. sorry about that. So here's what it looks like. 
The organs are on the outside of the body, but they're in a sac. This is very dangerous. Now there's another similar presentation called gastroschisis, which is similar to lymphalocele, except that the organs are not contained in a sac. The sac is still part of the peritoneum. This is an isolated birth defect, and it's usually not associated with any other syndrome, so that's the good news. Although it looks more severe, this is actually less severe. And baby can be, this can be surgically corrected and baby will be just fine. Renal agenesis. Now, obviously we know that genesis, like from the Bible, is the creation. A is non, so non-creation of the kidneys or underdevelopment of the kidneys. They're not fully formed or they're absent entirely. They fail to form in utero leading to problems, problems, problems. Commonly the result of genetic defect and occurs more often if one or both parents are missing a kidney. I'm not talking about they've donated a kidney. I'm talking about they were born without a kidney. So you're likely to pass that trait on. Cystic kidneys just describes a wide variety of, of things. Lots of different classification might occur in one or both kidneys. More likely in males, depending on the type of problem, the range of treatment may be medications to kidney transplant. As you can see, it's the same kind of thing as forming cysts within the ovaries, except there are cysts within the kidneys. Anorectal atresia or stenosis. Again, similar to the other one where the anus doesn't form up correctly and then they're unable to defecate. There's also hypospadias, which is birth defect in males where the urethra in the male penis opens in an abnormal location. Second most common birth defect in males, one out of every 300. This also needs to be surgically corrected. Finally, we've got hermaphrodites, also known as indeterminate sex babies. This is more common than you might suspect. Babies are born with their genitalia somewhere in between the spectrum of internal and external. How does this happen? Well, like I was telling you guys, all babies are females for the first six weeks. And then if we're, we have the Y chromosome from our dad, we start the process of masculinization, defeminization. And if that does not happen properly, boom, we're born somewhere in the middle. And usually the doctor makes a decision as to whether we need to go male or female. And this will involve surgeries as well as perhaps the administration of hormones like estrogen or testosterone to influence this. However, sometimes doctors guess incorrectly. This is sometimes what causes um, patients who have gender identity crises where they're male or female and yet they feel their chemicals in their brain are telling them to react as the opposite gender. There's definitely a difference in the genders. There's not a difference in the races. This is why we have people with gender identity um, disorders. And this has always been a thing in history, but now we finally have the ability to, as an adult, undergo these changes. There's a big controversy as to whether we should allow kids under 18 to perform these surgeries. And the reason we argue for that is because if we, if we start these changes when they're under 18, we'll have better success at um, finishing this process. The problem with it is, can you really let someone who's not even 18 make that decision that's going to affect the rest of their lives? I don't know where I stand on that issue, but regardless, I'm glad I didn't have to go through it. Here's a couple of images of what we can see. So this, depending on the stage, this can appear in lots of different ways. Hydrocephaly, this is water on the brain. Too much CSF buildup. So this needs to be corrected by shunts, which will direct that water directly back into the, uh, I'm sorry, directly back into the, uh, the gut, the abdomen. However, all this pressure in the brain might cause some sort of ischemia, so they might have some developmental issues later in life. These are extreme cases, but sometimes we don't see these, uh, these buildups. Spina bifida, congenital disorders, which result from the improper formation of the neural tube. It can have three different forms. Occulta, where there's a cleft in the vertebrae. Meningocele, a section of the neural tube forms a sac that bulges through the vertebrae. No neural tissue is contained in the sac, it's only CSF. And then there's myelomeningocele, the most severe form, where the sac and the meninges containing the nervous tissue are looped and they're outside of the body. We'll see some photos here in a second. 
Surgical correction is possible, but myelomeningocele is associated with paralysis and neurological deficits, possibly caused in part by maternal deficiency of folate. Remember I told you how important folic acid is? Parents with spina bifida, patients with spina bifida should be transported in left or right lateral recumbent. So again, occulta just means a buildup of pressure because of those meningeal layers. Meningocele is when the meningeal layers are extending outside of the body. So we have CSF in there. And then myelomeningocele is when we actually have this part of the spinal cord in there. So there's the, uh, there's one, I think that's um, the myelomeningocele there. Anencephaly is a birth defect that occurs between um, the 23rd and 26th day when the cerebral hemispheres fail to form. This one's pretty amazing. So first the cerebral hemispheres form, the different sides of your brain, and then your facial recognition. Oh, I'm sorry, this, that's a different one. This is when the brain, uh, the cerebrum starts, fails to form, is anencephaly. Then there's arinencephaly or holoprosencephaly. Oh my goodness, it's easy to say all these words. These are severe birth defects where the brain fails to split into two hemispheres. And that's when the facial features also fail to form. Now, what's interesting about this, as you'll notice, these are two different babies, but both of them have formed in a similar way where they have a mouth structure, one eye, and then this weird nostril structure on their forehead. Interesting that they always present this way. However, these babies are not going to survive if they survive to term, unfortunately. Microcephaly, this one was big a couple of years ago when Zika virus became a big thing. <clears throat> In fact, the new major cause was the Zika virus. This is when their head is smaller, so don't expect them to have very much cognitive ability, unfortunately. Anophthalmos or microphthalmos, this has to do with the malformation or too small formation or non-formation of the eyes. Or they develop very small eyes. They'll usually be blind. I, by usually, I mean they'll be blind. We can perform cosmetic repairs, but it's not possible to, to perform a, a, a successful eye transplant yet. That might be in the future, <clears throat> but so far it's not. All right, anosia or microtia, this has to do with otitis. So this is the ear formation. So either the ears don't form or the inner ears don't form or they form too small. A lot of these people will be deaf permanently and some might be able to have their hearing restored if um, there's still internal function, if they still have the cochlea. So you can see there's no ear formation at all on these babies or on these children. But we can have some surgical repair, including uh, implantation of, of prosthetics to help the hearing. As you can see, there's something hanging off the back of this girl's ear, so I'm pretty sure she needs some sort of cochlear implant to hear, but we're able to visually make it normal looking. And then limb reduction defects. Maybe you guys remember that uh, song, We Didn't Start the Fire. One of the lines he talks about is, children of thalidomide. That was a big thing. Thalidomide was a chemical that was big in, I think, the 60s. I thought we'll see in a second, yeah. Given to mothers in the 60s as a cure for morning sickness. And it worked really well. The problem is, is a high incidence of infants born without limbs. It prevents the formation of new blood vessels in developing babies. So 10,000 babies were born with missing arms, missing legs, sometimes both. I went to school with someone that had this. Polydactyly, this is when we have more fingers or more toes than average. Some of them are just vestigial appendages, I mean, we don't, any, don't have any control over them. And some of them are fully functioning fingers and toes. The record is this guy in India who has 34 digits. He has seven on each hand and 10 on each foot, and they all work. He should be a piano player. Pretty amazing. All right, final thing we're going to look at, and then we'll go to lunch here, chromosomal abnormalities. So there's 20 there's 23 chromosomes in the human body there's 46 matched pairs to form 23 chromosomes so there's a couple places where it's very likely to go wrong that we can recognize 13th chromosomal abnormality includes some intellectual disability and polydactyly cleft palate omphalocele heart defects eye defects all those things we we're basically just talking about 
They can also be, um, they can also have mental effects as well. 18 is a chromosomal abnormality where they usually will not survive because of cardiac malformations, unfortunately. In fact, that's going to be a big thing that we see coming up and again and again is people with Down syndrome, unfortunately, usually don't live into their 50s or 60s because they are very um, likely to have comorbid cardiac features going on with them. I've never met anyone with Down syndrome in their 60s. I've worked with, with kids with Down syndrome. When I lived in Peru, I worked with a, a bunch of people with Down syndrome. And let me tell you, it's a huge spectrum, the ability they have to understand the world around them. Some of them can be taught things. Some of them cannot really be taught things at all, and they need full help. Most of, almost all of these, I think it says um, 80% are females for this one. This is not Down syndrome. We're going to get to Down syndrome in a second. This is, oh, now we're here now. This is the 21st chromosome. So 21st chromosome is what causes Down syndrome. Average IQ is 50, but this varies pretty widely. About 20% of all Down syndrome patients are employed in some capacity. They're either low functioning or high functioning, depending on their ability to perform normal tasks. Male Down syndrome patients are infertile. Another problem associated with this chromosomal abnormality. Depending on the degree, many will die in their 50s because of cardiac problems. The big risk factor for this is increased maternal age. Finally, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. How can we recognize fetal alcohol syndrome? There's a couple of features we can look at. Moral of the story is there's no safe amount or time to drink during pregnancy or, or during breastfeeding, okay? Alcohol will be excreted through all exocrine glands. You'll sweat it out, you'll pee it out, You'll, it will come out in the mammary glands. So it comes in a couple different spectrums, but they'll all generally present the same way, which is smaller heads, shorter, lower body weight, poor coordination, hyperactivity, poor attention span, difficulties in learning, speech, intellectual abilities, poor reasoning skills, vision, hearing, kidney, home, sorry, heart, kidney, and bone defects. We're gonna see some craniofacial abnormalities even if there's no um, brain damage. So one of the big ones is this smooth philtrum. That's the groove between the nose and the upper lip, right? It's that, uh, if you can feel it right underneath the middle of your nose, right above your upper lip, we all should have kind of a groove there. Now in kids with fetal alcohol syndrome, notice how smoothed out it is pretty much universally. This is one of the big ways you can tell fetal alcohol syndrome as well as the widening of the eyes a little bit. This is the, the difference in their brain versus a normal child's brain. 